This is the Natural History Museum. Welcome to NHM Live. In a couple of minutes, you'll be meeting one of our scientists. This is your chance to ask some questions directly. We look forward to hearing from you. Let's find out who our scientist is today. My name is Natasha Almeida. I'm a PhD student and assistant curator of meteorites here at the Natural History Museum. We hold one of the oldest collections of meteorites in the world, with the first specimens being acquired in 1802. Meteorites are rare samples of extraterrestrial material that's been knocked off asteroids and planets. Most of them are left over from the formation of the solar system, so at four and a half billion years old, they're older than any rocks on planet Earth. My primary job is to protect the collection, making sure everything's in the right place, correctly stored and documented. We also send out loans to other scientists, classify new meteorites and work on our own research, like my PhD project on micro CT scanning. I love my job because it's so diverse and it's a real privilege to look after these scientifically important specimens. Hello, welcome to NHM Live. I'm David and I'm here with Natasha and today we're going to be talking about meteorites. So send in your questions uh, and we'll try and get through as many as we can today. Now, Natasha, uh, our collection is enormous. It's diverse. We've got all sorts of things in it. But I think, well, I know that the collection that you look after is the oldest and the most furthest travelled. How many specimens do we actually have in the collection? Yeah, so we've got about 4,800 meteorites in the collection, which represent 2,000 different individual meteorites. Okay, that seems like quite a lot, more than I was expecting. And let's dive straight in there. Um, how old is, I'm going to pick it up, is that okay? Of course, yeah. Excellent. How old is this meteorite that we've got here? Okay, so this is the Parnali meteorite, which was, uh, it fell in India in 1847. Um, and so it's an ordinary chondrite. Okay. We know that from the rounded chondrules, which you can see inside the sample here. Chondrules, they're, sort of, they're the small They're the sort of small circular, they form as like spheres. Okay. Um, and this one actually comes, it's 4.567 billion years old. Right. It comes from the asteroid belt. But that's older than planet Earth then? It is. Okay. okay. And, and we know that because of these chondrules? Um, yeah, we know that due to isotopic dating of the individual ah, okay. things inside of here. Um, we know that it, it comes from the asteroid belt because we observe, um, well, we've observed asteroids which are similar in composition. Okay. But in order to understand exactly where these chondrules come from, we probably have to go to the beginning of the solar system. Uh, it's always a good place to start, <laughs> isn't it? So you mentioned they come from the asteroid belt. Um, let's, yeah, let's go back to the beginning of the solar system and actually how the asteroid belt started in the first place. Okay, so at the beginning you have a very dense cloud of dust and gas, okay? And it starts to collapse in on itself uh, due to gravity, it gets higher and higher in pressure and eventually a sun can form. Now our sun accounts for about 99% of all uh, the mass within our solar system, but left over after that formation was about 1% of material. And that formed into this protoplanetary disk. Imagine this, all this material just spinning around very fast, okay. around in a disk of material. Yeah. Now the chondrules formed in these, free, these little silicate spheres in yeah. free space, they started to stick together, they're sticking together with metal grains and all the rest of the material left over, and gradually they start to form asteroids. Okay. And they have more gravity so they start to clear the material around them and maybe they knock into each other and eventually form planets. The actual asteroid belt is pos potentially a failed planet. It's in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter but uh, although this material sort of a was accreting together, Jupiter, its gravity had quite a big effect and so no single planet could form in that area and a lot of that material was thrown into the inner solar system. Wow, okay, pretty exciting, but I guess the start of the solar system was always going to be quite exciting. And how do they actually end up um, as a meteorite here? Oh, actually, I think what we should do is let's take a step back. We've so far mentioned asteroids and meteorites, but I know that there are meteors, uh, meteoroids, and we've got comets as well. Um, how would you explain to, to someone who doesn't know their planetary rocks exactly the difference between these things? Yes, we like terminology in science. <laughs> um, okay, so you have an asteroid, which is a large rock that's orbiting the sun, and that's mostly in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, that you have some that are closer in as well. Okay, mm -hmm. so very large rock. Um, a meteoroid is essentially similar to an asteroid, but it's probably less than about a metre. Okay. It's not such a commonly used term. Um, it's called a meteor when it's actually travelling through Earth's atmosphere. Okay. So when you see it as a fireball or a shooting star or something like that. And if that fireball ends up with some uh, rock that we can actually pick up 
and then classify and put it in our collections, then it's a meteorite. Excellent. I hope everyone's got that sorted. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so, and there are different types. I think that's one thing that, that a few people might know. But when I think meteorite, um, I think something like this, and straight away we can see it's a bit different from the chondrite, and, and it's very heavy. Uh, how does this differ from the first one that we looked at? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so then we have to kind of continue thinking about the evolution of the solar system, and that's why meteorites are so fantastic. Different meteorites can tell us different things. Mm -hmm. This is an iron meteorite. This one is actually called Henbury, and there's another nice example of it here. This is just where we've cut a slice through, through the same rock. And this, um, imagine if you have one of these asteroids and it's made of this chondritic material. So you have chondrules and metal and all this thing mixed in. Yeah. When those asteroids get very large and potentially form to the size of a planet, mm -hmm. they have a lot of heat. Right? There's a lot of radioactivity going on and there's heat from impacts and this kind of thing. Now, when you have a molten body, all the heavy stuff sinks to the middle, which is why, you probably know, the Earth has an iron core right. and this is what we see in other planets and very large asteroids as well. Okay. So the iron meteorites are left over from impacts of large planetesimals that no longer exist. Right and we can so we think that these iron meteorites are from the core and what about the, the chondrite is that from a different place do we think on the asteroid? So the chondrites are coming from those asteroids which haven't got big enough to melt and change. Right so, so it it's almost comes with a, its own signature a that it's a an asteroid uh, sorry a meteoroid but also it gives you an idea of what sort of asteroid it might have come from we already get a sense of its history. And what we can study from them if we look at chondrites we have the the very earliest material that formed right after the sun if we look at iron meteorites, we can understand potentially what it's like at the centre of our own planet. We're never going to get a sample from what, 6,000 so kilometres down. So answering some pretty big questions. I'm starting to see why you're so fascinated by them. We've got a couple of questions coming in, which is great. Sure. Do keep sending them in. Um, Cam uh, wants to know, and she's obviously spotted this, um, there's a crisscross pattern. Maybe we can have oh, a look at that yeah, again on sure. this part of the iron meteorite. And that beautiful. Um, what is that a natural process? It is, yeah. So that's one of the ways that we know that it's a meteorite actually and not um, something from Earth. So this is called the Widmanstaten pattern. One more time. Widmanstaten okay. pattern, named after the count who discovered it, I believe. That's my favourite type of pattern, I think, so far. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, what this actually is, is crystals of metal growing. So you never find anything like that on Earth because on Earth the metal cools so quickly it cools almost like a glass. It has no order to it. But something like this has potentially cooled, you know, a few degrees Celsius in a million years. It wow. cools so slowly wow. that the atoms are able to order themselves into these kind of crystallographic orientations. And that leads on to another fact, which I'm sure some of you at home might be wondering as well, is how we know something is a meteorite. So this pattern is something you would never see on Earth. Are there other things that we get with meteorites that we wouldn't also see from rocks on, on planet? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, we do actually have an identification and advisory service. So if anyone is interested, if they found one, they can always bring well, it to the museum call you or up have or a look. Bring it in. Yeah, or send us an email of a okay. picture. Or, yeah. And can you tell, it was instantly when you see it, can you tell, oh, that's a meter right or a meter wrong? Actually, it's quite difficult. Some of them are challenging. Some of them are quite easy, but some of them aren't. So, um, for example, with iron meteorites, often people think that they found one, but it actually ends up being slag or industrial waste from the production of iron. It must be quite a shame um, when you have to tell them that they haven't found it one. It is a little bit disappointing, sadly, but, so there are some telltale signs. So most meteorites contain iron, so mm -hmm. they tend to be denser and heavier. So this is a very good indication if you have a, a rock that's heavier. If it looks different, if it doesn't look like the rocks that you see normally um, in your area, um, if it has this, which is, I don't know if you can see it very well, but it's called a fusion crust. So it's very dark on the surface and it's uh, almost got these kind of thumbprints in yeah. it. Yeah. And so this is actually from where the, the outside of the meteorite melted as it was moving maybe... 10, 20 kilometers a second through the atmosphere. Wow. So it gets really hot and melts on the surface. Wow. If you see a fusion crust, that's another good indicator. So it's, um, it's actually got sort of marks of its violent history as it's coming into the uh, present on the on the meteorite. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. So if, if it ticks all those boxes, uh, then it's probably worth giving us a call. Cool. Well, we've got some more great questions uh, coming in. Uh, let's see if we can get through a few more of them. Mm -hmm. We've got a question from Maria. I thought someone might ask this. What size is the largest meteorite found on planet Earth? Good question. <laughs> yeah, so the largest one that we know of is the Hoba meteorite, and that's in Namibia. Um, it's something about four metres at least across. Um, and Do we have it in our collection? Probably, uh, we have a little piece of okay. it in our collection, not the actual thing. It's so big, it's estimated at over 60 tonnes, they haven't even excavated the whole thing. 
Wow. So that's a big one. What's the biggest one we've got in our collection then? Um, yeah, that's the Cranbourne meteorite, which actually you can go and see. It's on display in the museum. We needed a crane to move it into the gallery. Um, that one's just three and a half tonnes, but still rather impressive, I think. Yeah. I think that's, that's not bad. It's worth a visit, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, these are good, brilliant questions coming in. And um, I quite like this one, which has come in from um, Camilla, uh, which is a question, do all meteorites come from the asteroid belt? Now, the two that we've looked at so far do, but do we see them from anywhere else? Ah, that's a good question. Um, so there are two places other than the asteroid belt where we know that we have rocks from. And here's a very nice example of one, if we can zoom into that one. This is actually a lunar meteorite. So it comes from the moon. Um, it landed in Sahara, mm -hmm. uh, in the Sahara Desert, so that's why it's got this name, Northwest Africa. So we're sharing the room with a little bit of the moon. Yes, no, it's not that little. Okay, it's not bad, yeah, no, very <laughs> impressive. So, yes, yeah, so we do have pieces of the moon, lunar meteorites, Lovely. and we also, should I get the gloves on if we have, have a look at this one here? We also have pieces of... You put the gloves on there. Is this one is presumed? Is it more precious, or we just don't want to contaminate it? Yeah. So we hand, we use gloves to handle all of our meteorites here because there's lots of uh, oils and other contaminants on our hands that mm. we don't want to transfer. Okay. These ones we've sort of decided there they can be used um, for events and handling. Okay. Whereas these ones are a lot more precious and rare. So, so definitely wouldn't be holding then? this one with our hands. So I'll just take it out here. Oh, well, oh, that's got an, a crust zoom as into well. This one. Yep, is that so the same can, thing that? You can see that very nice fusion mm. crust. Actually, on this one, it's a lot shinier than on a metal meteorite. And that's because this one contains a lot more silicate material. So it's, it's sort of when that melts, it forms more of a glass. So it looks nice and shiny on there. But if you can have a look at this, uh, don't be fooled by the color. I know it's mostly green. Uh, it's actually from Mars. Wow. So not all meteorites from Mars are red. That's fantastic. None that's a big, big old chunk as well. Yes, we have the main mass of Narkla here. So this one uh, fell in 1911 in Egypt. It was seen to fall. There's only five meteorites that come from Mars or actually seen to come through the atmosphere and land on Earth. And we have a piece of all five here. Wow. And wow. you can go and see a couple of them in uh, the vault gallery. Well, we're very lucky to have one uh, with us today. Uh, now, one of the ways that we can actually uh, know so much about the meteorites and also how we can uh, then learn about our solar system is by studying them. And actually here at the museum, uh, we've got lots of facilities to study our meteorites. Um, so I was very lucky enough to go behind the scenes with Natasha earlier this week and find out a little bit more. We've had an introduction to meteorites, some of the different types that we get, but now we're really going to get to grips with them and find out what's inside. So we're down here in the belly of the museum at the Imaging and Analysis Centre with some fancy equipment surrounding us. And Natasha, you're going to talk us through some of the research that you've been doing and quite a revealing approach to meteorites. But we've been studying meteorites here at the museum for a long, we've got a long history of studying meteorites here. Um, maybe you can talk us through some of the ways that we've studied meteorites in the past. Yeah, so we've had analytical laboratories at the museum for about 150 years now. And historically, in order to look at what's inside of them, you'd have to cut them up. So this is just a slice through a meteorite. Okay. Or, for example, here, have a thin wow. section, yeah. which is only 30 microns thick. That's very thin. It is. A micron is a thousandth of a millimetre, so it's very thin. Okay. But it means that we can shine light through a sample, look at it with a microscope, tell what minerals are inside, look at the textures of the rock. Thin sections tell you an awful lot. Okay. Another way that people historically would sample them would, well, even presently, would analyse them is by making a powder. Do you see that grey powder? Oh, yeah, right there? at the bottom, yeah. Yeah, so this is a, a sample that's just been powdered in a pestle and mortar, and then you can digest it in an acid, look at the elements inside. Uh, so, yeah, we've done it for about Brilliant. 150 years now. It's, it's interesting to see, obviously, these slices and the way that it's ground up, but there seems to be a bit of a problem in that, obviously, we're destroying the very thing that you're, you're trying to study and preserve. Um, is there ways we can do it now without doing that? Yes. So, as a curator, obviously, we want to study these samples as much as we can, but what we're very interested in here at the museum is what kind of information can we get from non-destructive analysis? Okay. And that's why this technique, micro-CT scanning, is so appealing. And I'm guessing that big old box behind you is the CT scanner. Yes, it is. And Great. so I brought a fragment with me from the collection today. Uh, this is Vigorano here. Do you see it in the bag? Beautiful. So we can leave it in the bag. Literally no preparation other than that. Mm -hmm. And then we take a piece of Oasis foam, which is florist foam, and stick it in there. And this will make sure that the sample doesn't move at all throughout the scan. But that's it, really. Put it in the bag, pop it in the, in the foam, and you're ready to stick it in the scanner. Exactly. Great. Well, let's so get inside. Okay, so I place it in it's the quite, middle it's of quite the stage. big, isn't it? Presumably we can scan quite large things. It, it is very large. We can scan things up to about 25 centimetres in okay. size. Great. So we put it onto this, which is a rotating stage. So this stage is going to move 360 degrees mm. throughout the CT scan. And this here 
is a gun which actually releases a cone beam of x-rays okay which go through the sample and then if you can see it they're all collected on a big panel oh, detector yeah. panel at the back there so this cone beam is going to pass through the sample yeah as it's rotating, 2,000 x-rays, at least, are collected by the detector panel at the back. And that's why it spins, I'm guessing. So all of those x-rays are all the different angles of the meteorite. Exactly. So don't worry, this is a lead-lined box, so it's absolutely fine and safe to be near the sample. Okay. So I'm just going to move the stage up a little bit, and here you can see a single x-ray through the scan. Right, well, let's leave that running. Let's have a, a cup of tea, and then when it's finished, you can talk us through exactly what it's showing us. <laughs> So we've got a meteorite next door in the CT scanner and that's collecting the data. How long is that going to take before we get some sort of output, some uh, image from that? So with that kind of size sample and the type of sample it is, I put that in for about a half an hour scan. Okay. And then that data is going to go to a reconstruction computer and then we're able to download it to the computers over here. Right, but in the meantime, you very kindly got an example of one that you've scanned earlier. Yep. Uh, is this meteorite here that we've got on the screen, is that similar to the one we're scanning next door? It's also a chondrite meteorite, which okay. I think we mentioned before. This one just has a little bit more metal in it. Okay, and we can obviously see different shades here on the uh, computer. Perhaps you can talk us through what they, they mean. Yep, sure. So this is a single slice through the data. So what we've got is about 2,000 virtual slices through this meteorite. So as you're moving it there, we're literally going through it, flying through it slice by slice. Yeah, virtually cutting it. Okay. So as the uh, X-ray moves through the sample, it will penetrate each different material differently. Okay. So where you have a very bright area, like this one here, yeah. this is a very dense material. It's harder for the X-rays to penetrate through them. Okay. So this is iron-nickel metal. Right, and that's pretty much the densest sort of stuff. The we're densest get thing that we find meteorite. in the meteorite, okay. exactly. So when you look at this kind of mid-grain material, these are the silicate minerals, the rocky minerals that we find on Earth. And then here, if you can see it, very small little pore spaces, or here, a large crack through the sample, which comes out as black. It's very easy for the X-rays to move through that sample. So as you're getting a sort of a map of the meteorite, but unlike that slice that you showed us before, which is a single image, this is the whole thing. Yep, and that's virtually the beauty of it. 2,000 slices through the meteorite. Brilliant. So this is viewing the data in 2D. Mm -hmm. The great thing about CT is that you can also do it in 3D. So oh, great. If we go to can you this show us view that? over here, this is what the whole chip Fantastic. of the meteorite looked like. So this is just a virtual colouring where you can see it looks kind of grey. And the really cool thing is that I can say to the computer, okay, this is where all the metal is, and I can tell it to remove all of the other minerals present and just visualise <laughs> the metal. Wow. Okay, so each of those single colours, those dots, is a different type of metal? Why, are they, why have we got different colours? Nope, so it was all metal, and then what I've actually done is separate them out into individual grains. So all of these individual colours are single grains, and here you can see this very bright one in turquoise here. This is all interconnected, so it's one large vein that we see moving through the sample. So we've got all this information and data that we couldn't have dreamed of acquiring before, and to top it off, we've not destroyed the meteorite. <laughs> Welcome back, and thanks for all the questions that have come in. Uh, we've got plenty to crack through with, so I think we should go straight back on, but do keep saying that, sending them in. Um, um, there's two questions that came in online that are quite similar. First of all, Adam wanted to know what sort of craters do these rocks leave, these meteorites, and that links into what Andrew wanted to know, which is um, how big would a meteorite have to be to make us extinct? Hopefully that's not mm -hmm. happening anytime soon. Okay. Um, so what kind of craters do they make? They make mm. impact craters, and actually you see the sort of shapes that you have these spherical craters like we have on the moon. The Earth was also hit just as much. The thing is we have lots of geology, right? So we have volcanoes and atmosphere and tectonics and things that are removing that record. A very nice example is the Meteor Crater, which is in Arizona, Barringer Crater. Um, so this is 1.2 kilometres across, this impact crater. That sounds enormous. It that sounds, sounds like enormous. Something, yeah, which would do a lot of damage. Um, but it was caused by something that's only about 50 metres across, an iron meteorite, okay. and didn't do that much damage in the middle of the desert. Right. How big would something have to be to make us go extinct is quite a tough question. It depends on the thing, um, you know, the material that's impacting and where it hit and stuff like that. Um, I guess let's take the dinosaurs one as, a, um, as an example. If yeah, one loves a meteorite that killed the dinosaurs. Um, so this is about 65 million years ago, mm -hmm. something that was around 10 kilometers in size smacked into the earth at the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. The impact crater that it's made is about 180 kilometers in diameter. Wow. Okay. And that caused <laughs> enough problems to make them uh, 
probably be the main contributing factor to them going extinct. So you would have had uh, huge tsunamis, um, earthquakes stronger than any that we felt in human history, and then a lot of material thrown up into the atmosphere, which may well have you know blocked out the sun. So and bad news all round for the yeah. dinosaurs on that one. OK, well, hopefully there's nothing like that on the horizon. Um, what we've got are some, some other great questions. We're going to jump around a little bit here, mm -hmm. keep you on your toes, Natasha. Um, good question that's come in. Uh, are meteorites hot when they land? Because ah. you think of them sort of steaming away, don't you? Yeah, so they're very hot as they're coming through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But most meteorites, you know, if you look at a fist-sized meteorite, then by the time it actually... Um, falls to the earth, it's falling just under its own gravity. It's lost an awful lot of that speed okay. and also that heat because it's right. been melting on the outside and then it's losing that material to the atmosphere. And so when they fall, now it's really difficult because not a lot, lot of meteorites have been picked up straight after they fell, but the majority people say they're sort of cool to the touch. Okay. Which would make sense if it's been in cold, dead space for four and a half billion years. That's the thing, of course, we forget. Yeah, but there are, um, but they do generate a lot of heat as well, don't they? We've got this which isn't a meteorite, but it, it is something caused by a meteorite. Yes, uh, so this is an impactite. It's actually called a tektite. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a really nice example of it, actually, a huge one. So uh, this is also a tektite. I don't know if you can see that one too. Yeah, it looks cute. Now, these are earth rock mm -hmm. that have been impacted by a meteorite. So what you've got to imagine is that there's a very large impactor coming in and it hits the earth rock and it transfers lots of heat and pressure and that rock is thrown out away from the crater and it's flowing as molten rock and then eventually, and this one's very nice because it's a sort of teardrop, raindrop. Does, yeah, streamlines. Raindrop shite, yeah. yeah. So it's molten rock that has cooled as it's landed. Okay, and how teardrop. far can that be, be thrown? Very far. So this one was found actually by my boss in the Nullarbor okay. Desert in Australia. And we think the impact crater that it came from is somewhere around Cambodia. Wow. So it's raining rock uh, very far, thousands Crikey. of kilometres. <laughs> uh, that was a good question, yeah. And we're going to, again, we're going to jump around. Um, I like this question. A bit of a, more of a personal question for you, Natasha. Would you like to go into space to collect rocks? Uh, yes, I would really like <laughs> to go to space to collect rocks. I think I might wait until it's a little bit more like Star Trek and very safe. Okay. Warp drive, make it nice and quick. That sounds... I mean, it'd be great to go to Mars. It's going to take about eight months. Uh, but <laughs> it does actually lead on nicely to uh, another question which we've got, which is we saw in that um, in the video earlier all the work that you've done on CT scanning, and we've managed to to look a lot at our own collection. But it's such a cool piece of kit. Um, actually, others came knocking as well, including NASA, who have been to uh, um, to the moon to collect rocks. What yeah. um, what help did NASA want from from us and the CT scanner? Yeah, from you. So, um, so my boss went around telling everyone how great our CT scanner was mm -hmm. and how good we are. And so the Apollo curator, lovely guy called Ryan, uh, he was interested to see how they could potentially use it for the curation of Apollo rocks. Okay. Because they didn't have this kind of CT scanner um, at NASA. So he brought over these Apollo 14, 15 and 16 rocks. Wow. And uh, with some, some questions. How do you transport Apollo rocks in very secret carefully. and carefully? Yeah, very <laughs> okay. carefully without telling anyone. Um, so... Yeah, so he brought them to the museum. We put them into the scanner. There were a few that had specific questions. Um, but there's one nice example, I think, um, of Apollo 60639, yeah. it's called. So on the surface of this rock, which is a breccia, so most uh, lunar rocks are, they're rocks made up of lots of other rocks because they've just been mixed by all the impacts. Right. And so on the surface of this, you could see a little piece of basalt. Okay. Now, people love basalt. It's a volcanic rock. We, we find it on Earth in Hawaii and so places like this. So there are volcanoes this. on the moon, then. But there are, yeah, so there's volcanic activity on the moon. In fact, when you look up at the moon and you see the dark bit, the black kind of bits, that's basalt. Okay. So that's uh, from volcanic so activity. So what did they want to find out from our scanner, then? They had this little bit of basalt. So they could see a little bit on the surface, but if, obviously, if you're a curator, you want to know how much sample you have, you want to know where it is, you want to cut it properly in the best way to waste the least material and expose what you're interested in. So what we were able to do with putting it in the CT scanner is actually see how large the clasp was, how far it extended into the sample, and we could actually tell sort of what kind of basalt was and um, what type of minerals we see inside. Brilliant. And NASA were happy, were they? Oh, they're very happy, yeah. Excellent. I got to go and visit, actually. Oh, that must have been fun. We'll have to do another Nature Live, uh, NHM Live, to, to, to learn about that. Sure. Um, we've got lots of more questions coming in, so I'm going to keep firing at th mm -hmm. them at you, a bit like meteorites, and see if you can deal with them. We've got uh, a good question that's come in, which is... Uh, oh, it's from James, aged five, going back to uh, about the dinosaurs. Um, 
Where did the meteorite come from that, that killed the dinosaurs? Are we oh. able to actually work out where these meteorites have come from? We know from the asteroid belt, but more specifically. Yeah, that's quite a tough one. So um, for the one that we think killed the dinosaurs, we can't do that because we don't have any of that material left over. Mm -hmm. So we don't know um, what it was made of. Um, so it could have been a comet, it could have been an asteroid, we're not entirely sure. Um, we can do that for ones that we witness coming in now. So for okay. example, the Chelyabinsk, uh, right. did you see this one a, a few yes, years ago? It was uh, caught on all huge. the dash cams Absolutely. in Russia. Yep, so because they had so many different vantage points of seeing this thing come through the atmosphere, mm. some very clever people, much smarter than me and better <laughs> at maths, were able to back calculate um, which group of asteroids that came from. Right, so trigonometry style times Three million or something, <laughs> probably. And we've actually got a camera at the museum, don't we? Right at the top of the museum, um, tracking the skies for meteorites. Yeah, so there's the UK Fireball Network, um, which are often That's watching the name. skies. <laughs> yeah, so there's a European one, there's an Australian one as well. And so, um, yeah, we have it pointing up. Uh, you can just about see a bit of the tower, I think, in that image, the NHM tower. A lot of the time we capture rare planes going past, but yeah, sometimes we do catch meteors. Uh, there's one very successful one actually in Australia. They have the Desert Fireball Network in the Nullarbor. Mm -hmm. um, so they've actually uh, seen a large fireball come in, which they think they had material left over. They sort of um, triangulated where that would have been and actually found the meteorite, which is really cool. So we're hoping that we'll have that kind wow. of fireball in the UK. With that accuracy to actually pinpoint where it's landed. Yeah. Brilliant. So it's so important to keep an eye on, on the skies with these. Uh, these oh, yeah. Cameras. Always look up, even despite the light pollution in London. Uh, I'm loving these questions that are coming in. I like that. We're testing you out a little bit here. Um, this, is, this is a good question from Joshua, aged five. Uh, and he wants to know, have any people on Earth been killed by a falling meteorite? Oh, you know what? No. No? Okay. No. And the chances of it happening are, are very, very low, so it's not something to keep you up at night. Um, there are two instances that I know of of people being hit by them. Okay. Um, so there was one, I believe her name was Anne Hodges in the 50s in Alabama. Um, and yep, this meteorite came through uh, her roof, bounced off the TV and hit her in the side, left her with a nasty bruise, but um, that was all. It's a good story to tell though. For, yeah. I know, can you imagine? How did you get that? I heard a rumour, the Narkla, the Martian, uh, Martian meteorite that we were looking at earlier. Yeah. A legend has it that apparently it actually hit a dog when it, it fell down. Is, do, do we know if that's true? <laughs> I mean, they call it the dog meteorite, um, but as far as I know, there's been no evidence of dog on, on the meteorite. Okay, um, so, yeah, I would say that's more of a legend. All right, good question though, Joshua. Yeah, that, that took us in wonderful direction. Um, let's ask quite a difficult question. Um, this has come in from Camilla again, obviously knows her meteorites. Um, how come we don't see more craters here on Earth, but we see so many on other bodies like Mercury and on our, our moon. We've, we all see the moon just through a telescope. You can see hundreds of craters. It's a good point. Why don't we see so many here? Yeah, well, that's because there's not much happening on the moon. There hasn't been for, for four billion years or so, whereas on the Earth, we still have a very active geological system, right? So we have, uh, you know, new rock being made all day at mid-Atlantic, mid-ocean ridges or um, at volcanoes, and we have plate tectonics, which move around and destroy part of our crust. So uh, the oldest rock I think we find on Earth is only about four billion years. Everything else is much younger. And obviously we have our atmosphere and all this causes weathering and destroys the right. geological record. So we were probably hit even more than the moon because we have much greater mass, greater gravity. We attracted more. We just don't have any evidence of it, Okay. which is a shame. Whereas on the moon, it's this wonderful historic document of its violent past. There's four and a half billion years of history here. So we really need to go back. Wow, fantastic. And maybe when you go to the moon, you can take a, a closer look as well. Um, let's see if we've got any more uh, questions uh, that have come in. Uh, we've had one through from Tracy. Uh, this is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Could we move the Earth away from the sun with a meteor when the sun is dying? So it means, would, the, would, would there be a meteor big enough to actually move the orbit of the Earth, do we think? I mean, I, I highly doubt it. And I think if it was big enough to do that, then it would have melted the whole surface of it. We probably have lost a lot of material and there's certain wouldn't have been any point in doing that because everything that would have been alive on the Earth would be dead, sadly. Interesting. I think question. the better thing to do is for us to start exploring the Moon, Mars, Europa, Titan, other planets and moons where we could potentially live so that by then we've already left Earth and 
explored the rest of the solar system. And these system. meteorites are actually giving us the sort of the basic information that we need to, to start to understand what these places might actually be like. Yeah, definitely. Well, you've shown us a piece of the moon, uh, a piece of Mars. You've shown us uh, bits of rock which are older than Earth itself. It's been quite a journey. Natasha, thank you ever so much for, for sharing it with us. Thank you for your wonderful questions uh, from um, Facebook Live. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the show. Don't forget to, to follow us and share it with your friends and we'll see you next time. Thank you.